the name of Jesus that every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's resurrecting power in the name of Jesus. There's transformative power in the name of Jesus. There's healing power in the name of Jesus. He's still rescuing us from ourselves. Hallelujah. He's still healing. He's still providing. He's still delivering. He's still protecting. Begin to lift up the name of Jesus wherever you are. We thank you. We bless you, God. We repent of every time we've taken advantage of your grace. Advantage of your mercy, God. Oh, oh. But you've given us a name that we can call. You've given us a name that can save us. Call the name, call the name. We bless your name. Oh.
Your loving kindness is better than life itself. Call on the name of Jesus. Let him rescue your heart. Transform our hearts today, Jesus. Open up the blinded eyes today, God. We have another yes to your will. We say another yes to your way. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Your will is better for me. Your will is better for me. So we love to call him Jesus. Jesus. Keeping me in my right mind. Hey, I. 
The month of March, we were mandated to shelter in place, but because we serve an awesome God, Bill Mount Zion Baptist Church was granted His grace to reach beyond the church's four walls and serve the community and its needs from giveaways, teachings, and sowing seeds. First, through a donated amount of over $16,000, Bill Mount Zion was able to begin assisting families with community engagement projects spearheaded by the Good Samaritan Outreach. We stretched across middle Georgia by administering COVID-19 tests, assisting with food, household living essentials, and by sending gentle reminders to fill out and send back the 2020 census forms because every body counts. Secondly, through the advanced technology of Facebook, YouTube, and live streaming, Bill Mount Zion is growing, inspiring, teaching, and engaging the masses across and outside the state of Georgia. Through live sermons, 3D classes each Sunday, and virtual live classes each Wednesday night. Lastly, God will not give a vision without provision. With that being said, Pastor Teddy Parker Jr.'s vision is still alive and thriving, even while a pandemic is going on. 2020 marks the 20th year of Camp Zion. 149 students virtually participate in lessons, activities, and virtual field trips. So you see, the church is not a building. Build Mount Zion is impacting lives daily, weekly, monthly, just not from the pews. This is the day the Lord has made. We choose to rejoice and be glad in it. We're so thankful that you all have taken the time to invest your energy, effort, uh, and your time to worship with us as we give praise to the Most High God. We give God praise for our music ministry, powerfully leading us into the presence of the Almighty God. If you're worshiping with us virtually, we ask that you will take, uh, take out your smart device. If this is your first time, text the word CONNECT to 478 242 1116. That's connect to 478 242 
1116. We want to get better acquainted with you and engage with you as you are being a part of our virtual community. We also want to give God praise for our church family for uh, just the wonderful love and support that you all have shown to Miss Loretta, Deaconess Loretta Brooks and her family during the loss of our very own Deacon George Brooks. What a wonderful celebration uh, we had for him this past Friday. It's not our normal celebration, but because of social distancing, uh, we had to make it work. And thank you all so much for the love, the prayers, and the support for uh, this wonderful family that has impacted our lives in so many ways. Uh, as I said previously, Deacon Brooks is a major pillar of our church, and the Lord uh, used him in a mighty way uh, to be a blessing to me personally and to so many people within our congregation. So please keep Deaconess Loretta Brooks in your prayers as we are all continuing to cope and to grieve uh, the loss of our very own Deacon George Brooks. Uh, with that being said, uh, brothers and sisters, we're going to transition now. Uh, let's go ahead and prepare to give, everybody. We know that the Word of God teaches us that God loves a cheerful giver, and we are expected and we are called by God uh, to be kingdom distribution centers. God gets blessings to us to get them through us, and so we're asking that you will go ahead and take out your device or whatever method you choose. Uh, the, the different options are right there on your screen, so let's continue to sow our tithes, our offerings, our sacrificial gifts. Don't forget about our COVID. 19 uh, outreach effort that's allowing us to be a blessing to so many families during this time. As you all have seen during our uh, pandemic progress report last Sunday and earlier in the worship experience today, there are so many families that are being blessed and impacted by the grace of God and the generosity of our congregation. So go ahead and prepare to give. And with that being said, I'm going to ask that you will pause with me now as we bless both gift and giver. Father, we thank you so much that Everything that we have belongs to you and that you give us the benefit and the, the pleasure of partnering with you to impact and to influence lives for your glory. We pray that you will continue to give us the wisdom to use our resources wisely, that we'll continue to uh, be generous and to be uh, favorable in our efforts to sow into the lives of those who are in need. We thank you, Father, that you have blessed us and increased us, and we pray that you will continue to do so so that we might continue to be a blessing to others. We give you praise, honor, and glory for how you are continuously walking with us, guiding and leading us. We thank you because we believe that you are eradicating debt from our lives. You are helping us to save and invest and to wisely manage the resources that you've given to us. So we give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all of God's people say amen. Amen. To God be the glory. We give God praise for both gift and giver, and we thank God because he's going to continue to bless us to be a blessing to others. Well, brothers and sisters, family, virtual community, it's time for us to hear the word of the Lord. And listen, I needed some time to be able to grieve correctly, and I thank you all for being a wonderful congregation who understands that. Uh, the loss of Deacon Brooks impacted me, and I'm thankful that I've been able to take some time to be able to process it. God is so amazing, and we've had a uh, time that we can just celebrate this awesome man of God, and I've had some time of reflection this week, and it gives me great joy to be able to take some time to do that uh, more appropriately, and I give God praise for you understanding that, but you know that I will not leave you hanging in the pulpit, and so I called uh, our extended family back to the BMZ pulpit, our very own brother in Christ, Dr. Daryl Hall, campus pastor of Elizabeth Baptist Church, the Conyers location. He's going to come and help us to continue the blackish series. This series is getting a lot of notoriety. It's getting a lot of commentary. I'm praying that it's blessing and challenging you. And I'm so excited because I believe my brother and my friend, Dr. Daryl Hall, is going to bless us with a powerful word that's going to transform our lives. So with that being said, let's go ahead and tune in right now as we prepare to hear the word of the Lord through my brother, my friend, Dr. Daryl Hall, campus pastor of Elizabeth Baptist Church, Conyers, Georgia. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Well, good morning to you, Bill Mount Zion. Listen, I'm glad to be back. I'm always glad uh, to connect with you, whether that's in person or here virtually, um, because your church uh, has an affinity uh, in my heart and in the kingdom of God for the simple fact that I love and respect uh, your pastor. Uh, we thank God for Pastor Paul Little II, uh, my friend, my brother, a uh, great leader, great husband, and, uh, and just a stand-up guy. Man, thank you so much for allowing me to step in and support you this week. And uh, as I pray for you um, privately, uh, please allow me to also pray now for you and for Bill Mount Zion uh, publicly. I'm excited to get into the word, but before we do, let's pray. Dear Lord, I lift up this great church, this, this branch 
uh, of Zion in middle Georgia that you're using to impact even to the ends of the earth. I thank you for the good work that's happening at Build Mount Zion. I thank you for your spirit that is at work, for all the victory and success they've experienced, the fruitfulness of the ministry there. Um, but I pray right now for Pastor Little and for the Build Mount Zion Church that you just give them the grace and strength during this time uh, as they are adjusting to so many variables, so many complexities, so many difficulties. May they do so with the full assurance of faith and confidence that you are God. I thank you right now that COVID sheltering in place and closing the physical doors of the church have even made Build Mount Zion stronger. And even during this week, I pray, oh God, for supernatural grace on Pastor Paul Little, his wife Natalie, all who lead and serve at this great church, even down to the least of these, uh, my brothers and sisters. I thank you for this opportunity to share the word with them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. I'm excited to get into the word today. Uh, I have my Bible and I hope you have yours. Go ahead and grab it if you would, please, uh, and join me in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter one is where we're going to be today. I'm excited to share from my heart what I believe um, the Lord can use to encourage us, to strengthen us, to give us wisdom and guidance in the times we find ourselves. Again, Daniel chapter one is where we're going to be, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. We're going to discuss much of Daniel chapter one, but we won't read it all from the outset. Permit me, if you would, to read verses one down to verse number four of Daniel chapter one in the New King James Version. The word of the Lord says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Verse three, then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the kings uh, and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature, of the Chaldeans. I want to talk today with this simple thought in mind, victory in a hostile environment, victory in a hostile environment. 2020 uh, has been a doozy, hasn't it? For many of us, what we are facing globally and even nationally has caught us off guard, uh, particularly what's happening with COVID as well as what's happening with racism here in our country. COVID has shut the whole world down, it seems, to the extent um, that schools are closed, churches are closed. Uh, many of the places where we frequent have been or may still be closed. Uh, and in addition to that, sports have been stopped. Well, today I'm excited because uh, here recently we just uh, got word that some sports are coming back. The NBA is going to attempt to make a comeback this July, and so is the MLB. Now, I'm a sports fan, to be honest. I'm born and raised here in the Atlanta area, so all of my teams are Atlanta teams. In football, my favorite team is the Atlanta Falcons. When it comes to baseball, my favorite team is the Atlanta Braves. And in basketball, my favorite team is the Atlanta Hawks. What I'm most excited about when I watch uh, every new sports season is trying to figure out what new way will my Atlanta team let me down this year. <laughs> if you are an Atlanta pro sports team, you understand heartbreak is our lot. Disappointment uh, has been our portion. I'm particularly excited about baseball. I believe we have a young promising team in the Braves and hopefully with the truncated season, they may be able to pull off uh, the unthinkable of actually competing for a World Series. When we think about sports, what we see oftentimes through athletes is its ability to perform in pursuit of victory even in a hostile environment. Athletes have this, this unique ability to train their minds, their bodies, and their spirit, spirits to enter places where people are rooting against them, where, 
where the people are not for them, where the environment has been intentionally set up for their defeat and for them to lose. And yet athletes prepare themselves mentally and emotionally and physically to pursue and secure victory in hostile environments. Well, if you haven't looked around lately, you're living in a hostile environment. But the shouting news is victory is still possible. I'll never forget something my mom would tell me all the time as a boy growing up. She would look at me uh, as a single parent uh, and I was her only son. She would say to me, Daryl, uh, you already have two strikes against you. You're black and you're male. Don't allow your poor behavior or your poor decisions to give this system a third strike against you or else you'd be out. See, that was a baseball metaphor. If you've if you've never seen baseball or if you're somewhat familiar with it, you understand that people may come uh, to the to the home plate with a bat in their hand prepared uh, to try to hit the ball. Now, the goal is to hit the ball in such a way that they can get a home run over the back wall and be able to trot around all three bases and come back home safely. But if a home run is not had, they would be glad to settle for a triple, a double, a single, or even if somebody else is on base, a sacrifice fly. The goal is to swing the bat, to hit. Now, here's the thing. Each batter only gets three chances to miss, meaning three strikes and you're out. See, what my mom was saying to me is, uh, I live, I grew up, I was reared in a hostile environment. As a black man in America, I was stepping up to the plate of life to take my best swing, and I already had two strikes. Meaning what? The next swing, the wrong swing, a misstep, a mistake, could mean out for me as it has meant for so many others in our nation. <sighs> how unnerving it is, how distressful it is, how frustrating it is to realize uh, the, the difficulty of trying to perform in a hostile environment. What's amazing about baseball players is for those who bat around 300, that means 30% of the time they make contact, they're paid millions and millions of dollars. Think about that. What's being thrown at them is so difficult. The pitches that are being thrown, the speed of the pitch, the angle of the pitch, was being thrown at them is so difficult that if they can only hit it three times out of 10, them and their family will be rich forever. You know, three out of 10 sounds about like the statistics of what it means to be successful as a black person in America, doesn't it? That some of us who've benefited from the sacrifices of others have been able ourselves only about three times out of 10 to do something right, but that, that little performance has translated into much success compared to what our people have endured, not just for us as African-Americans, but also for us as Christians, um, where we step to the plate, so to speak, in, in, a, in a sinful world, trying to be holy in a hostile world. And it seems as if there are already strikes against us. My mom was trying to educate me and, and initiate me uh, to a reality that W.E.B. Du Bois coined as double consciousness. Now, Du Bois was a brilliant man. He lived almost 100 years. He invested in the African-American uh, community in a multitude of ways. And many of his thoughts to this day are still riveting for me. One of which is the talent to 10th. Uh, the other of which is double consciousness. This idea of double consciousness says that I must live in America with two consciousness that are always active. And I must be socially ambidextrous and that I'm able to switch between one or the other at any moment for the sake of my survival. What does he mean? He means that this double consciousness requires me to always remember that though I may be uh, American, I am black in America. Those two consciousnesses must always be at the front of my mind such that I'm able to adjust for the sake of survival. Now, I don't mean to presume my thoughts to rival that of Du Bois, but uh, permit me, if you would, uh, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, using my sanctified imagination to add to his concept, let's expand it some to triple consciousness. Here's my argument today from Daniel chapter one. All of us must live with a triple consciousness. 
If we're going to have victory in a hostile environment, if we're already stepping to the plate with two strikes against us, if we only have one swing to try to make contact, if what's being thrown at us is so, so difficult and it's, uh, and it's, it's, it's a tact that, that we can barely have success compared to those who are also taking swings, then it requires that we have the mindset, the heart, the spirit to seek victory, even in hostility. And that mindset must be marked not by a single consciousness, not just by a double consciousness, but let me baptize it, triple consciousness. What do you mean, triple consciousness? What we'll learn from Daniel 1 is this. All of us are living in three different ways in a hostile environment. Here's the first way. For those of us who share similar ethnicity uh, as me, we are we are black, right? We're not just black. We're also Christian. We're not just black and we're not just Christian. We're also American. Let me say that again. If we're going to survive, if we're going to have victory in a hostile environment, the mindset we must have is one that's marked by triple consciousness. Let me give them to you in order of the layers that I identify with most. We are Christian. In an unchristian world, we are black in a white America, and then we are also Americans, though many of our liberties have yet to be actualized and appreciated. So what does that mean? That means I must live with these three consciousnesses in my mindset if victory is going to be possible for me, if I'm going to be able to overcome what's being thrown at me. Daniel chapter one is one of my favorite stories is it's the story of four young boys who are in a very peculiar predicament. They are prisoners of war to be sure they are not in a place where they would have chosen to be. But as a result of some things that happened before they even were born, as a result of the idolatry of the Hebrews and uh, and those who were supposed to be worshipers of Yahweh and Jehovah, they find themselves now as prisoners of war taken out of Jerusalem. And now they have been taken to Babylon. And while in Babylon, they have to exemplify what it means to live with a triple consciousness. Why? Because we're Christians, but for them, they were they were Jewish. They were worshipers of the one true God. So they were trying to be holy in an unholy place. Then second of all, they were also Hebrew in their ethnicity, meaning they had different customs and cultures, yet they were in a Chaldean culture. Then the third thing was they were also supposed to, according to Jeremiah 29, they were to seek the welfare of the city, meaning just because they were not from Babylon doesn't mean they should not seek the best for Babylon. They, they could not, in the name of Jehovah, uh, also do wrong to Babylon. No, Jeremiah 29 tells uh, God's people, uh, seek the welfare of the city where you are. Go ahead and bloom where you're planted. Go ahead and flourish where you are, even though... You may be in an environment and in a geopolitical terrain um, that does not see you uh, as an equal or as a valuable citizen. So what we see in these young boys is the Holy Spirit using them in such a powerful way uh, such that they still speak to us today. And the Holy Spirit whispers from their testimony wisdom to those of us who likewise have to live with a triple consciousness if we're going to have victory in a hostile environment. There are a couple of thoughts I want to share with you from my heart and from this text that I think uh, would inform our triple consciousness. Here's the first thing. Uh, in order for us to experience victory in a hostile environment, uh, here's the first thing. We must embrace our distinctions. We must embrace our distinctions. Now, remember, by interpretation, these three boys were were were, were Jews in a, in, a, in a polytheistic society. These boys were Hebrews uh, in a Chaldean culture and, and they were also to seek the welfare as citizens of Jerusalem. They had a triple consciousness. But in order for them to have the right mindset to see victory, uh, they had to embrace what was distinct about them. And this text is full of different examples of their distinctions. Here's the first thing. We note that they were distinct in their ancestry. <laughs> I love it. The Bible says they were distinct 
in their ancestry. Where you see it, Rev, verse number one and verse number two, uh, we see that this, this Babylonian king uh, takes back these Jews uh, to Babylon. Then in verse number three, hear what it says. The king, uh, who we later discover is Nebuchadnezzar, instructs Aspernaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel, listen to their ancestry, and some of the king's children and some of the descendants of the nobles. I'm in verse number three. It's amazing to me that uh, a pagan king, a wicked king, an idolatrous king, a godless king, when seeking uh, the type of people he wanted to draft from his, his prisoners of war, he sought people with a distinct ancestry. See, he didn't just want anybody. He wanted people of, of, of kings, of royalty, of queen, of nobility. He wanted people with good stock in their genetic code because he understood uh, that if you come from good stuff, if you come from good stock, if you have royalty and nobility uh, in your ancestry, then you are predisposed to win. <laughs> That's why we got to be distinct in our ancestry. Uh, see, when it comes to us living with this triple consciousness, we can't give up who we are and from whence we come. Why? Because the genetic code that we bring to the table, the blood that is running through our veins is not the blood of, of just anybody and just any old person. No, we have distinct nobility and 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 royalty uh, and 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 fighting and victory and winning and overcoming. It's all in our genetic code. We're predisposed <laughs> <laughs> not just to survive, but to thrive. For those of us who share uh, uh, African-American descent, if you're listening to this, this, this message today, think about what it took for you to be alive in 21st century America. Uh, we are not native to America, meaning uh, we can all trace those of us who are, who are, who are, who are brown skin and black skin. We can trace our ancestry back to, to Africa at some point, which means of all the people who came across the Middle Passage and the slave, slave trade. Think about the probability of those who had to survive. All right. Then once they made it to the shores of America, think about those who survived all the new sicknesses and diseases that they were met with because their their bodies could not handle uh, uh, what what many of the slavers brought over by way of disease. Then think about those who survived chattel slavery. Then think about those who survive Jim Crow. The probability that you would be here in the 21st century is based upon the survivability of people who've gone through things for the last four or 500 years that if it had not been for the presence of God and if it had not been for something special in their genetic code, if it had not been for their fighting spirit, they would have never made it through it, which means what? <laughs> you are the result of the best of us who survive things that we wouldn't wish on our worst enemy. That's why the devil is after you. There's something in your blood. Now, this is not me trying to emphasize uh, blackness over Christness or Christ likeness, because again, in our triple consciousness, my first identity is as a Christian in the unchristian culture. My second identity uh, is as a black in America. My third identity is as an American citizen. I'm all three at the same time, but also in that order order. But we cannot overlook our distinct ancestry because the, the temptation for us is to want to be accepted in the mainstream, understanding that mainstream acceptance sometimes means the denial of who I am and from whence I cometh. So if we're going to embrace our distinctions, we're distinct in our ancestry. Here's another thing. Uh, we are distinct in our appearance. He says, I want king's kids. I want descendants of nobles. I want young men, listen, in whom there was no blemish, but good looking. <laughs> he says, I want a specific profile now. I want people with, with nobility uh, in their ancestry, but I also want people who, uh, who, who are good to look at. I want people whose, whose appearance uh, speak for them. Uh, I'll never forget the lessons I, I, I've learned from a multitude of people. And that is you never get a second chance to make a first impression. See, there's something about our appearance, the confidence with which we walk and engage and enter uh, an environment that should reflect not just what we know about our ancestry, but also what we know about our ancestry from a spiritual perspective. See, we're not just 
uh, king's kids in the natural. We're king's kids in the supernatural, in the spiritual. And all of that ought to come into how we present ourselves. The beautiful thing about the way God created humanity is that he made humanity uh, with diversity, with variety. Now, the problem is where God created diversity, the world has created division. Where God created variety, the world has created classism, such that what is depicted as physically acceptable or beautiful or, or, or appealing to the eye only benefits those in majority culture. What that does to us psychologically is it makes us wish we were anything other than what we are in order to feel good about who we see when we look in the mirror. How many of us wish we could <laughs> reshape our nose, reduce the size of our lips, lighten up, brighten up our skin complexion? How many of us have dealt with even classism among black people because light skin and dark skin don't get along? How many of us wish our hair was was not as kinky or a little more kinky? How many of us wish uh, that we had a different hair texture or a different eye color? How many of us wish we were taller or shorter? You get the point. Um, the reality is there's a difference between having insecurities and being insecure. I want to speak to insecurity. I want to speak to those of us who are insecure in our physical appearance, not realizing that we're comparing ourselves to a false standard. God never meant for me to look like them. Because if he wanted me to look like them, he would have made me like he made them. No, he made me like he made me. Therefore, my appearance is one that must be so distinct that I glorify my intelligent designer by how I show up, how I appear, how I groom, how I dress, how I present. Understanding all of that ultimately is not an effort of vain glory, but it's to bring glory back to my God who made me uh, in his image. David says it this way, I was fearfully and wonderfully made. <laughs> Jesus says Solomon, uh, 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 you know, in all his splendor, though he was arrayed in all his splendor, still can't compare to the lilies of the field. Uh, what, what is Jesus saying? Jesus is saying, listen, uh, um, God takes care of the lilies of the field. He also takes care of people. But in both situations, beauty, when, when you see it, beauty in its aesthetic appeal is a reflection of the God who created it. How can a God who created the beautiful rainbow and a God who created beautiful snow-capped mountains and a God who created uh, the beautiful ocean and a God who created a multitude of geographical terrains and topography not also be the God who created you? And if he did, why can't you look at the rest of his creation and the beauty that he he left in the stars in the sky and he left in a full moon on a, on a dark night and he left in the sun that illuminates uh, uh, our our solar system. If he can make all that beautiful, why wouldn't he make you beautiful too? Handsome, appealing, aesthetically pleasing to the eye. That is important. It reflects your intelligent design. Uh, this, this pagan king said, I want people who are distinct in their ancestry. I want people who are distinct in their appearance. I also want people who are distinct, hear me, in their ability. Listen to what he says in verse number five, uh, no, verse number four. He says, I want people who are gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, quick to understand, who have ability to serve in the king's palace and who, who, who who's even smart enough to learn a new language. I want to teach them the language and literature of the Chaldeans. They were distinct in their ability. The king, in other words, said, I want people who got some king's blood, some queen's blood. I want people who look the part, whose, whose appearance reflects uh, 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 the, the, the blessing of an intelligent designer. And I want people who have mental capacity and ability to learn new things. That's what the enemy was looking for. If an enemy king is looking for that, what you think God is looking for? God created us such that he's given us each unique abilities. But the worst thing we can do uh, in light of trying to survive in a hostile environment, when we abandon triple consciousness, one of the ways we do that is we hide our abilities to make the majority feel comfortable in their lack. We hide what God has created us to do, what he's made us able to do, just so other people would like us and want us around. When I speak about what the majority lacks, I don't just mean Blacks as a minority to whites also mean women as a minority to men. There are oftentimes there are women in male dominated 
uh, uh, industries who have to dumb down the ability that they have in order to make the men at the table feel, feel more like men. Listen, the word of the Lord for us is he made us with distinct abilities. Therefore, we ought to embrace those distinctions. It is our abilities that 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 reflect the unique anointing, the unique shaping of our character, the unique uh, uh, a molding of our plan, the plan God has for our life, the trajectory he has our life on. When we're more concerned about dumbing down our abilities to make other people feel comfortable in an attempt not to offend them, we end up offending God. How many of us have offended God because we won't embrace the distinction of an ability he's given us? What you mean ability, Rev? When I say ability, I mean what has God equipped you to do that you can do with less effort than most people can? <laughs> Listen, all of us can do something better than most people who try to do it. That ability reflects what your God, your creator put into you, baked into you, sent with you into this earth because that ability is an indicator of the purpose God has for your life. Stop this day trying to make other people comfortable by pretending like you're not as smart as you are. Stop this day trying to make other people feel comfortable by pretending like you don't have the ideas you have. Stop this day trying to make other people comfortable by pretending like you don't have the wisdom you have, hear me, and trying to make other people comfortable and try not to offend other people. We don't want to cause the Holy Spirit discomfort. We don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. And we don't want to offend God who gave us those abilities. See, those abilities are not just in the natural. Remember, we're king's kids in the natural, but we're also king's kids in the supernatural. Those abilities... When, when, when baptized by the Holy Spirit, that's anointing. <laughs> Don't dumb down your anointing and hide your supernatural power because the people around you are not believers. A part of that triple consciousness is understanding that I'm distinct. Though I live with these three consciousnesses at all times, I got to embrace the distinction of being Christian in an unchristian world. That means I'm anointed being black in a white world. I have unique skills and abilities. Also being an American having to embrace that and what my unique abilities bring ultimately to America's, not just gross uh, domestic product, not just America's economy, but also the fabric and the beauty still of what this country can become. That is our responsibility with triple consciousness. We got to embrace our distinction. <laughs> How? In our ancestry, embrace our distinction in our appearance, embrace our distinction in our ability. Here's another way we're distinct uh, uh, in our acculturation. I love it. We are distinct in our acculturation. What does that mean? To be acculturated means to come into a culture as a minority. And 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 though you may uh, be absorbed in a sense into that culture, you don't lose your distinct customs, language, and ways. You 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 come into a culture, uh, and, and and you're in it. Come in, Jesus, but you're not of it. <laughs> You remember when Jesus prayed in John 17, I pray that they will be in the world, but not but not of the world. See, it was never God's will for us to be separated. No, he wanted us in it, but conscious of our, 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 our responsibility to be in culture, but not of culture. Meaning, as Christians in America, we're distinct in our acculturation. Distinct in the way we relate to culture. As, as blacks in a white world, we are distinct in our acculturation. Meaning, meaning we, we, don't, we don't give up uh, uh, the culture that is germane to our our people uh, in the name of trying to be mainstream. A as Americans, there's a distinct culture uh, about being American that, that, that we're in, hear me, but not of. We're distinct in our acculturation. Where do you see it, Rev? I'm glad you asked. It's in verse number five. So the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and three years of training for them. So at the end of that time, they may serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And to them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. To Daniel, he gave the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. See, Daniel was distinct. Him and his friends in their acculturation, meaning they realize 
They were in a culture, but not supposed to be of that culture. In other words, they had to live in multiple worlds at the same time. It really uh, is depicted in verse six and seven. If you notice, he says, uh, verse five, six and seven, uh, this pagan king wants to educate them, meaning to fill their minds with Babylonian thoughts. And for three years, they were to go to school and be educated in Chaldean literature. Now, their absorption of Chaldean literature doesn't mean that they abandon Jewish literature. <laughs> it just means they have both consciousnesses. <laughs> what they learned for three years in Nebuchadnezzar's school, that mean they forgot what their ancestors taught them from the books of Moses while they were in Jewish school. See, just because they got to a foreign territory, hostile environment, and was forced to learn new stuff, don't mean they forgot the things they learned about Yahweh, the Sabbath, his will, how holy he was, how to please him, how to glorify him. Just because they learned new stories don't mean they forgot the stories of Abraham and, and Sarah, Isaac, and Rebecca, Jacob, and, and Rachel, and Leah. They didn't forget the stories of their ancestry and people just because they were forced to learn a new one. They were distinct in their acculturation. See, sometimes we make the mistake of thinking it's either or. Mm -mm. You can read American literature and also know the word of God. <laughs> you can know what thus said the Lord. You, you, you can listen to, to R&B music and also worship the Lord through your gospel music. You can have both. It's the consciousness of understanding that I'm in the world, but not of the world. I'm, I'm even distinct in the way I relate to culture, which means what? I'm a part of it, but I'm not so absorbed into it that I forget my distinction within it. Yeah, I'll learn Chaldean literature and language, but that don't mean I'm going to forget Jewish literature and language. Here's another way we see it in verse 6 and 7. Notice what happened. They, they changed their names. Whew, don't miss that. Their names have been changed from Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to, to, to Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What's amazing about each of their given Jewish names is that each of their given Jewish names reflect Yahweh or Jehovah in some way. For example, Daniel means God is my judge. That, that, that word E-L, El, is a reflection back to Elohim, the, the most high God, as introduced in Genesis chapter 14. So in each of their given Jewish names, their names reflect Jehovah. Each of their Babylonian names or Chaldean names reflect some false idol or some false god. Don't miss what this pagan king has just done. He's changed their names in an attempt to change their identity. But you know, they live with a triple consciousness. Meaning what? They would go to work and answer the Belteshazzar. <laughs> but come home and mama would call him Daniel. Uh, uh, they would go to school and friends would call him Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But they would come home and hear... Hananiah, Mishael, Nazariah. Uh, uh, see, out in the world, they were offered food that was cooked by idols and sacrificed, uh, excuse me, the idols and sacrificed for pagan gods, but they would come home and they would only eat kosher meals. See, they understood what it meant to be both and with that consciousness always in play to increase the probability of survival. Here's the problem. We've let the world change our names and because we've started answering the new names, we forgot our old names. You might recall that series Roots, don't you? LeVar Burton, who played Conta Kente, there was one particular scene, I'll never forget it. I saw it as a child, haven't seen it since, where the slave master was whipping him. And in an effort uh, to change his identity, he told him, boy, your name is Toby. And every time he hit him with the whip, he said, Conta Kente. Remember now, triple consciousness. I'm not depicting the white man as the enemy. What I am saying, though, as minorities in a majority culture, that what this culture keeps doing is trying to make us from 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 a ethnic perspective to answer to a different name from a spiritual perspective. What does Satan do um, with every lash? He tries to remind us of who we used to be, of what we used to do in an effort to make us forget that we are not what we have done. <laughs> so you got to be careful what you answer to. Why? Because uh, a name not only dictates an identity, but a name reflects true ownership, <laughs> true dominion. Think about it. If you name it, it's yours.
That's why God told Adam uh, back in Genesis chapter one and chapter two, I I'm going to give you dominion over all the birds of the sky and fish of the sea and beasts on the field. And then chapter two says, God brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. God named them, meaning uh, uh, God saw, 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 saw a horse looking uh, creature uh, with, with black and white stripes called a zebra. Uh, God saw a mighty steed uh, with great flowing hair and called it called it a pony, called it a horse. Uh, Adam did. I'm sorry. Adam, Adam saw uh, 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 Mufasa and, and Sarabi and, and, and Nala and Simba and called him a lion. Uh, God gave him dominion over animals, so he named them. So why would this king rename them? Because he's exercising his new dominion. Yet, don't forget that they understood that in the world they may answer to a Chaldean name, but at home they still have their given Hebrew names. See, it's not just what they call me is what I truly answer to. And it's not just even what they call me is, is who I know I really am. For many of us, we've allowed uh, our names to be given in exchange for some title at some job. Just because they called you associate or manager or supervisor or what have you, you have, for whatever reason, become deflated in your confidence because your title is not high enough or inflated in your arrogance because your title is high. Either way, what they call you at work is not who you are. It's not who, I work at a church. They call me pastor there, but I am, I was not born pastor. I'm Daryl Hall. So whatever prefix, whatever suffix, whatever title is given or taken from you, remember you are who God created you to be and ultimately your identity uh, is determined by him. Family, if we're going to have victory in a hostile world, we must embrace our distinctions. We're distinct in what ways? We're distinct in our ancestry. We're distinct in our appearance. We're distinct in our ability. We are distinct uh, also in our acculturation. We're in a world, but not of it. We live in both worlds simultaneously. We understand what it means to be called by one name, even though I know it doesn't reflect my true identity. Because my true identity, uh, as their Hebrew name suggests, uh, is always tied back into the one true God. So we must embrace our distinctions. Here's the second thing, and I'll be done. We also must exercise decisiveness. If we're going to have victory in a hostile world, if we're going to live with this triple consciousness of being Christian in a non-Christian world, of being black in a white world, and also of being American in a world that's increasingly more hostile to Americans, if we're going to have that consciousness, Right. Understanding in this text, they were they were worshipers of Jehovah in a polytheistic world. They were Hebrews by culture in a Chaldean world. But Jeremiah 29 told them, seek the welfare of the city where you are, meaning bloom where you are planted, even though you're planted in a hostile environment. They were all three at the same time. They had to exercise decisiveness to win in that way. See, we're at a time where. <laughs> Uh, uh, in history where um, you want to make sure you're on the right side of this. But not just what's happening with the injustices in our world, not just what's happening politically with the impending presidential election, but from day to day in our lives, we're given an opportunity to make decisions in either of those three consciousnesses. And we must exercise decisiveness. Meaning what? Our decision-making we can't wait for the decision to be upon us to make it. We must make the decision in advance of the decision by having values that are anchored in the word of God. See, when your values are predetermined, it doesn't mean you're going to live perfectly. It doesn't mean you're going to live flawlessly. What it means is uh, 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 you'll bat 300. <laughs> what it means is, is, is you might get a home run from time to time when you come to the plate. Uh, already with the values in mind that, that, that determine the way you see what's thrown at you. See, what when you live life without godly values, when you live life without Christ-like values, you, you come up to the plate uh, and, and you swing and you miss. But when you live life with godly values, you won't be perfect. You won't always do it right. You won't always do it well. But you will always increase the probability that victory is yours. How do we see that in this text? We see it in verse number eight. Now recall, the king says, I want you to get this specific type of person, bring them aside 
and I want you to educate them for three years and feed them all my delicacies. Meaning if I eat it, if it's good for me, it should be good for them. However, verse eight says, Daniel and his friends purposed in their heart, they weren't going to be defiled with the king's delicacies. Why? They were, they were decisive. They understood that what's a delicacy for you is defilement for me. <laughs> Don't miss it. Because they knew as Jews, as Hebrews, their diet was supposed to be kosher. Even beyond that, they couldn't eat meat. They weren't sure if it was sacrificed to a false idol. Meaning even though they were far away from the temple in Jerusalem, which had just been burned down, they didn't forget the lessons they learned about the God of that temple. You know, the mistake we make, we um, we try to bring people to the temple. Uh, and uh, whether your temple is, is a Baptist church, a non-denominational church, a Methodist church, what have you, we expect people to just be fully Christian in the temple. And, and we never really help people make value godly decisions when they're in Babylon. You know what COVID has done? COVID has closed the doors of the physical temple. But in a way, it's also exposed those who really know the God of the temple. See, you may not be able to go to the house of God. But the question is, do you live like you know the God of the house? The only way that's possible is if you have values that are predetermined by the word of God, such that when decisions come upon you, not if, when your values help you to exercise decisiveness. Now, all of us have had opportunities to make good decisions and have made poor ones. Some I hope that we reflect on and instead of feeling shameful, we learn from them, particularly as it relates to these three consciousnesses. What do you mean? To be Christian in a non-Christian world means oftentimes I'm going to be put in an environment where to be bold about my faith is going to make me feel uncomfortable compared to other people. But if I predetermine in my mind that I'm not going to allow what the popular consensus is around me about religion or Christianity to deter my faith, what happens is that gives me an internal strength and fortitude such that when a decision to, in essence, deny the faith comes, I've already predetermined I'm not going to defile myself with your delicacy. Another way we do it is as blacks in a white world. We're oftentimes in a desire to be accepted into uh, mainstream. We will also deny uh, in a way uh, our culture where, where we will begin to embrace uh, how other people dress, look, act, behave, style of music. And it's not that we per se like it. We just want to survive. And so we thought that surviving meant um, that we also had to give up um, pure parts, beautiful parts of our culture and of our people in order to fit into the crowd we want to fit into or be accepted into the school we want to be accepted into or get the job we wanted to get or be a part of the organization we wanted to be a part of. And if the truth be told, there are times that even some of us in a context where we were the minority and there were a majority of white people around, we can reflect on some of the things that we allowed to be said or we said or some of the things that happened and we reflect sadly on the way we didn't step up. Well, guess what? The goal is not to feel shame. The goal is to learn and live from it. Learn from it, live from it, and advance in such a way that we exercise decisiveness next time. But there won't be a next time, a victory next time, if the values aren't predetermined today. What do you value? What are your values? What are your non-negotiables? What are the marks in your life you're trying to hit? I'm not talking personality. I'm talking character. What type of person do you want to be? What is that based upon? That has to be more than just an emotional feeling. You know why? Because when decisions are high, emotions are low. Or excuse me, when emotions are high, there it is, decisions are low. Could you imagine them? <laughs> They're prisoners of war. They've been drug away from home. They're in a foreign land. Could you imagine them all day learning, reading in class, trying to learn this new language and literature, and they get to the lunchroom table and this food has been prepared. And their stomachs are growling. <laughs> they got red ribeyes and, and ribs and, and <laughs> all type of food just on the table. But yet they have to say no to it. Meaning what? They couldn't wait to get into the moment to allow the growling of the flesh <sighs> to make the decision for them. 
Because when emotions are high, decisiveness is low, which means what? I got to make my decisions based on values before emotions even get involved. Now, here's the beauty of it. Well, got some good news for you, some bad news for you. I'm going to tell you the bad news first, then the good news, and I'll be done. Here's the bad news. When you seek to live a value-based life, it's going to be hard at first. Here's the good news. If you embrace what's hard at first, it'll be easy in the end. I'm done. <laughs> Daniel and them said, we're not going to eat that. Just give us vegetables and water for 10 days. Test us. It had to be hard to eat raw, uncooked broccoli and Brussels sprouts and, and cauliflower and carrots and just water for 10 days watching everybody else eat steak and lobster and crab legs and, and, and ribeyes and ribs. However, at the end of the 10 days, they look better than the ones who were eating the delicacies. And then finally, they just gave up the whole diet and they went on what many of us call a Daniel fast. And one of the Daniel fast, it was Daniel's diet. And the Bible says in verse 17 that at the end of all this, they were 10 times better. See, that's victory in a hostile environment. That's stepping up to the plate, even if there are two strikes against me. With values based on a godly perspective, we're able to embrace our distinctiveness and exercise decisiveness. It may be hard in the beginning as Christians in a non-Christian environment, as blacks in a white world, as women in a, in a male dominated uh, industry, uh, as America's in, a, in an environment that is hostile to America. It may be difficult at first to make said decisions, but when we're guided by the spirit, you can rest assured that there is victory after the cross. I'm done. Um, thank you for having me today. It was my delight to share the word with you. As I close, I want to turn our attention to Calvary and to Jesus. You see, my mom told me there were two strikes against me. That's a baseball metaphor. Three strikes, I'm out. In baseball, if people hit it three times out of ten, they can make millions and survive forever. But see, when it comes to God, he has one standard. No strikes. No outs. But all of us in the frailty of our humanity will invariably strike out from time to time. The question is, do we get up to the plate and try to swing for holiness on our own? Or do we allow a pinch hitter <laughs> to step up to the plate for us? Jesus, the ultimate pinch hitter, stepped into the box. He was born of a virgin. He stepped into human flesh. He lived life as we do. He didn't take his swing from the dugout. He didn't take his swing from the owner's booth. He stepped down into the dirt as a human being. Instead of taking up a wooden bat, he took a wooden cross. And he bats a thousand. You know what that means? No strikes, no outs. Instead of trying to take a swing at holding this myself, I had rather just allow a pinch hitter to step in. Knock it out of the park for the glory of God. And then grab me by the hand. And we trot around the basis back home in victory. I want to encourage you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We're grateful for what you've said, what you've spoken, how you've challenged us. Ways you've made us think, perhaps in ways we never had before. Thank you for feeding our spirits and encouraging our hearts. But ultimately, may we not put our faith in our racial ethnicity and our gender and our socioeconomic status and where we live by way of zip code may we put our faith first and foremost in Christ and Christ alone because before I'm anything else may it be said of me that I'm a child of God in Jesus name amen have a good one well, to God be the glory. What a powerful word from my brother, Dr. Daryl Hall. Right there in your living room, in your bedroom, at the kitchen table. Let's give God praise for that powerful word from that powerful man of God who has blessed us immensely on today. We give God praise for the word and for how powerful and practical that word is. And it's going to impact us if we would just take it into our hearts, apply it, receive it, and walk in it. We give God praise for the word of the Lord. We want somebody now to respond to the word by way of an invitation to accept Christ 
or to join the church. Uh, if you have not accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says, if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. You can do that by simply uh, uh, bowing your head right now and praying, asking the Lord to come into your life and save you. And if you want us to walk with you through that process, you can take out your device and text the word accept to 478 478- 242-1116 to accept Christ. Text the word accept to 478-242-1116. Or if you're already saved and you're looking for a virtual church home, we would love to be your virtual church. And you can take, uh, take out that device. Text the word join to 478-242-1116. That's join to 478-242-1116. One 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 six. Somebody from our starting point ministry will reach out to you within 24 hours to help you to get assimilated into the family of God. BMZ family, let's go ahead and virtually give God praise for those who will be joining us by way of uh, salvation or membership. We give God praise for each and every one of you. Well, family, listen, by way of announcements and observations, next Sunday, everybody, next Sunday, spread the word. We're going to have our first outdoor worship experience. That's right. Uh, Pull up and praise is what we're calling it. You can see your flyer right there on your screen. Pull up and praise right here at 3268 Avondale Mill Road. We're going to be in the parking lot of the BMZ campus. Pull up and praise. We want you to stay tuned by way of word on the go, by way of text message, by way of social media, because there are some parameters that we want for you uh, to be mindful of as you're coming to worship next Sunday in the parking lot of BMZ. We're so excited. Our first outdoor worship experience. So stay tuned for more information about social distancing. We want everybody to wear masks. We want you to remain inside of your vehicles. And so all of that information will go out this week. You can get better acquainted with that information. But we want you to come this coming Sunday, uh, first Sunday in July, 9 a.m., not 1045, 9 a.m. this coming Sunday, our outdoor worship experience. And then starting on the first Thursday uh, in July, that's July the 2nd, life class will be moving from Wednesday to Thursday. So the first Thursday uh, in July, we're going to have life class, life class 7 p.m., same time, different days. So we won't have live class on Wednesdays starting in July. Uh, It'll be moved to Thursdays at 7 p.m. So adjust your schedules. Let's get tuned in. We're going to continue our series, uh, Creating a New Normal, as we're going through the study guide, the book, uh, Ordering Your Private World by Gordon MacDonald. And then on the second Sunday in July, that's July 12th, our 1045 a.m. worship is shifting to 10 a.m. So virtual worship will be at 10 a.m. starting on July the 12th. That's the second Sunday in July. 10 a.m. virtual worship. Make sure you spread the word. We're excited about it because we believe that the Lord is going to bless it. Uh, So just a simple time change and a day change for life class, Thursdays at 7 p.m. And then Sundays, 1045 is going to be at 10 a.m. virtual worship. Spread the word. Make sure you log on in time. Uh, Our 3D classes are going to take place at 9 a.m. each Sunday morning. So we want everybody to get up early. Let's get dialed in. Let's get tuned in so that we can start our day uh, fellowshipping, learning, uh, hearing the word of God together and worshiping together uh, starting on the second Sunday in July. We're very excited about it as well. Well, family, I'm praying that today's worship experience uh, was beneficial and transformative for you. We're so excited about what God is doing here at BMZ. Thank you all so much for the love, the encouragement, and the support. Let's continue to keep Deaconess Loretta Brooks and their family uh, in our prayers, our church family, and we're just excited because we believe that uh, the God of our salvation is a healer. He's the one who makes us whole. He's the one who strengthens and comforts us, and so we pray that you'll be encouraged. Let's continue to stay tuned in. Let's stay connected, and most of all, Let's stay faithful. We give God praise for each and every one of you. Let us close in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for today's worship experience. Thank you for every song, every prayer. Thank you for the word that went forth. We thank you for the ministry gift of Dr. Daryl Hall. We thank you uh, for our church family, our virtual community, for those worshiping with us for the first time. Thank you for the gifts, for the blessings, for all of the wonderful resources you provide to us so that we might do ministry uh, during this pandemic experience. We give you praise. 
uh, for all of your faithfulness towards us. Bless us now with a prosperous week. Bring us back here uh, safely midweek so that we can continue to learn and grow and develop to be all that you will have us to be. We give you great praise. We give you honor. And we give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all of God's people say amen. To God be the glory for, uh, for you, family. We love you. We miss you. And we pray God's blessings upon you. Have a great day. Virtual.